The middle of the 19th century saw Americans moving westward. The vast expanse of the North American continent matched their optimism. So also with Adventism, with its New England roots. The movement's energetic leader, James White, reflected the times, moving first to New York State, then a short time later to Michigan. Eventually the movement expanded worldwide. Today, historic Adventist village in Battle Creek, Michigan, brings to life 50 dynamic years in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church from 1852 to 1902. Battle Creek, with a population of 1,000, was a small rural village in south-central Michigan when Joseph Bates, Adventism's Apostle of the Sabbath, first visited the community in 1852. As a result of that visit, a peddler named David Hewitt and his wife Olive became the first Sabbath-keeping Adventists in Battle Creek. Soon, several others joined the Hewitts, making a small group who met weekly in the Hewitt home. In an authentic log cabin similar to the one in which the Hewitts originally lived, the story of Battle Creek's most honest man in town is told. It is little wonder that Adventism took root in Battle Creek, for the city has always been open to the people of differing viewpoints. Originally founded by Quakers, Battle Creek was an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Between 1840 and 1855, generous and caring town citizens helped an estimated 1,000 slaves to freedom. In 1859, as a resident of Battle Creek, Ellen White, Adventism's prophetic voice, admonished Sabbath keepers not to obey the country's fugitive slave law, which required that runaway slaves be returned to their masters. Today, the William J. Hardy exhibit showcases early African-American Adventists. The display is located in the home of one of those former Underground Railroad travellers. In 1855, four Michigan Sabbath keepers invited James White to move the church's small printing operation from Rochester, New York, to Battle Creek. Neither the welcoming little community nor the young but expanding church would ever be the same again. A year after James and Ellen White arrived in Battle Creek, local Adventists helped the Whites build their own home on Wood Street. Their authentically restored house is now the oldest Adventist landmark in the city. The White family of six, which included four sons, lived in it from 1856 to 1863. It was there that Ellen White first wrote out the Great Controversy Vision, given to her in March 1858 in Ohio. That astounding vision depicted the ongoing cosmic struggle between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. Not only did it reveal in detail how sin began and the central role that Christ's life and death played in resolving the sin problem, it also described God's ultimate solution, to assure that sin will never rise again. Directly across the street from James and Ellen White's home stands the small cottage that was once the home of Deacon John White and his wife Betsy, the parents of James White. It was only after moving here during their retirement years that those two hardy individuals from Maine came to see the beauty and importance of observing the seventh-day Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Because so many Adventist firsts took place in Battle Creek, the city has often been called the cradle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was here that the movement's pioneers took the first halting steps that resulted in church organisation. Many of these actions took place in the original 1857 Meeting House, which has been replicated in historic Adventist village. In 1859, the group adopted systematic benevolence, opening the way for the movement's few ordained ministers to be assured of financial support. On October 1, 1860, delegates chose the name Seventh-day Adventist and took the first steps towards incorporating the publishing work. The following year, the publishing house was legally incorporated. Also, in 1861, the Michigan Conference, the fledgling church's first state conference, was organised, followed two years later 
by the organization of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. On May the 21st, 1863, 20 delegates from six of the seven state conferences then in existence met in Battle Creek to make the organization official. At the time, the population of Battle Creek was about 3,500, approximately the same as the number of Seventh-day Adventists that then existed throughout the United States. About two weeks later, on Friday evening, June the 5th, 1863, in nearby Otsego, Michigan, Ellen White received a major vision on health. The consequences of that vision would revolutionize both the newly formed Seventh-day Adventist Church and the history of Battle Creek. Now, more than a century and a half later, scientific research has demonstrated that the Adventist lifestyle results in a longer average life expectancy and overall better health than that of the general population. In addition, Adventists operate a worldwide network of hospitals and clinics, successors to the once world-famous Battle Creek Sanitarium that had its beginnings in 1866 in a renovated house in Battle Creek. One byproduct of the Adventists' emphasis on health is the breakfast cereal industry, begun by health educator Dr. John Harvey Kellogg and his marketing genius younger brother, Will Keith Kellogg. The invention of flaked cereals by Dr. Kellogg while he was medical director of the SAN, as it was called, eventually led to Battle Creek's becoming known worldwide as the cereal capital of the world. Additionally, Many of the doctor's health views were reflected in various types of exercise equipment that he invented or improved. Examples of his creativity are exhibited in the Dr. John Harvey Kellogg Discovery Center in the village. Several types of his exercise equipment were used both in the White House in Washington, D.C. and on board the ill-fated Titanic. Modifications of some of the doctor's inventions can still be found in today's gymnasiums and exercise rooms around the world. Eventually, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, of which Dr. Kellogg was medical director for nearly 70 years, became world-renowned. Relocated to the village from its original site in Parkville, Michigan, is a small church that was originally dedicated on January the 12th, 1861. On that occasion, Fully three months prior to the start of the American Civil War, Ellen White was given a vision regarding the pending war. She was shown not only that it would occur, but that it would be a long and costly struggle, and that people present on that Sabbath would lose loved ones in the war. As history shows, these predictions proved to be all too true. Besides the buildings specifically built or renovated, to house early Adventist institutions, pioneer Sabbath keepers also often met in barns, those sturdy utilitarian structures without which farmers and others would not have survived. Both David Arnold's and Hiram Edson's barns in New York State served to host meetings of early Sabbath keepers in the 1840s. In Battle Creek, James and Ellen White's next-door neighbour, Jonah Lewis, built a barn behind his house. Three times each day, that early Adventist would go there to pray. A barn similar in appearance stands today in historic Adventist village, a silent tribute to those long-ago multi-use buildings that helped nurture the young Advent movement. Battle Creek also holds claim to several other denominational firsts. The first Seventh-day Adventist college was established here as was also the first elementary, nursing and medical school. Early on, those hardy Adventist pioneers came to understand the importance of educating the whole person, physically, mentally and spiritually, since they believed that the purpose of true education and the work of redemption really are one. No sacrifice was too great for them if it meant giving their children a Christian education. It was crucial to those committed pioneers that their children not just be educated for service in this world, but that they be prepared for wider service in the world to come. A rural 19th century one-room schoolhouse 
reminds visitors of education's role not only in the life of America, but especially in the ongoing success of the Adventist Church worldwide. During the half-century featured in historic Adventist village, Battle Creek and Adventism were nearly synonymous for Adventists around the world, for it was an action by a general conference session held in Battle Creek in 1874 that resulted in sending the denomination's first official missionary, J. N. Andrews, to Europe. Today, Adventists are found in more than 200 of the world's countries, still sharing their emphasis on health and wellness and education of the whole person, as well as their faith in the soon return of Christ. Around the middle of the 19th century, the citizens of Battle Creek welcomed a handful of Sabbath-keeping Adventists to their community. Today, historic Adventist village continues that tradition by welcoming those of all faiths and cultures from around the world to come experience the Adventist story, to learn about a people who by their beliefs and lifestyle live to honour God while seeking to benefit the entire world through their health, education and other humanitarian efforts coupled with their hope-inspiring message that Jesus is coming soon. Adventist Heritage Ministry also invites visitors to share the excitement of the Adventist story at its three other historic sites. The William Miller Farm, birthplace of the Advent movement in North America. The Hiram Edson Farm, theological birthplace of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the boyhood home of Joseph Bates, co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. For information regarding these sites, and directions to them, visit our website at www.adventistheritage.org. On the Sabbath, July 24, in the year 1915, some four and a half thousand citizens of Battle Creek came to the Dime Tabernacle that once stood on this site to say their final farewells to a little 87-year-old lady. Just what was it that made Ellen White so special? This is the biographical information blank that she completed in March 1909. She was 81 years of age at the time and described herself as being 5 foot 2 inches or 158 centimetres tall 140 pounds or 63 and a half kilograms in weight, with a rather dark complexion, gray hair and gray eyes. She records her birthplace as Gorham, Maine, on November the 26th, 1827, and the date of her conversion as probably in March, 1840. Late in August, 1846, at the age of 18, she married James White, Four sons were later born to them. Henry Nicholas in August 1847, James Edson two years later, William Clarence in August 1854, and John Herbert in September 1860. While such information is interesting, it doesn't give us any real insight into how she related to others or how she handled the disappointments and frustrations of her life. As God's messenger, did she have to experience sorrow and ill health or battle with appetite in the same way as most of us do? In the same way, this record fails to tell us of her love for animals and flowers, especially pansies, 
or how much she enjoyed attending auction sales and eating tomatoes. It does not tell us of the countless days spent mothering other people's children, or of her cheerful visits to her neighbours with products from her garden and practical advice for the sick. In fact, such information tells us very little at all about Ellen White as a wife and mother. If you had lived in Topsom, Battle Creek, St Helena or here in Curranbong, and known her as a neighbour or friend, how would she have impressed you? Topsom in the state of Maine, USA, is a town some 40 minutes drive to the northeast of Gorham, where Ellen White was born. Here stands the home that once belonged to Stockbridge Howland, a successful engineer and a prominent early Seventh-day Adventist. In October 1847, the Howlands offered a part of their home on the middle floor to the young James and Ellen White and their two-month-old son, Henry. They commenced housekeeping with borrowed furniture. Though poor, they resolved to become independent. James White worked hauling stone on the railroad and chopped cordwood in the forest, for which he was paid the handsome sum of 50 cents a day. In spite of their poverty and hardship, the young mother was able to write, Sufferings and trials bring us near to Jesus. In vision, she was shown that God had been trying them for their good and preparing them to work for others by preventing them from settling down at ease. Convicted that they must work for the salvation of others, and knowing the rigours of travel in the 1840s, the Whites were forced into a difficult decision. Ellen wrote, Alone before the Lord with most painful feelings and many tears, I made the sacrifice and gave up my only child for another to have a mother's care and feelings. They left young Henry in the loving care of the Howlands. Frequent visits helped to maintain the bond between the parents and their firstborn son and how happy they were when they were able to take him back into their home five years later as a well-trained praying boy. As fortune would have it, 10 years later in December 1863, that same Henry, now 16 years old, fell ill with pneumonia while visiting the Howlands. Sensing that he would not survive, he made his mother promise that he would be taken back to Battle Creek and laid beside his little brother John Herbert who had died three years earlier at the age of three months. As he said, so that we may come up together in the morning of the resurrection. When our noble Henry died, when our sweet singer was born to the grave and we no more heard his early song, ours was a lonely home. But God comforted us in our bereavements and with faith and courage we pressed forward in bright hope of meeting our children who had been torn from us by death in that world where sickness and death will never come. In 1856, the Whites moved into this two-story cottage in Wood Street, Battle Creek. It was the first home they had ever owned, and the original building contained six rooms before two lean-to additions were added. The front room on the ground floor served as a parlour and sitting room. Today, a museum, it served then as the room where the family assembled for morning and evening worship. In 1859, Ellen White began to keep a daily journal. It provides many glimpses of life in the White home here in Wood Street. It mentions making a pair of pants and a coat for her son Edson, age nine. Sunday, March 6, records her making a dress. After cutting it out and beginning to sew, things went wrong and she took it all to pieces and made it over.
Ellen White was an enthusiastic gardener. Her diary tells of planting out currant and raspberry bushes and strawberry plants. Her entry for Monday, April 11, tells us she spent most of the day making a garden for her children because she wanted home to be the pleasantest place of any to them. The White Home was always open to visitors, and at times it seemed to the family that they operated a free hotel. A diary entry in June tells of 35 eating at their table. The day after, Ellen wrote one brief sentence. We were all much worn out. Travelling to visit the churches occupied a large amount of the White's time. During extended travel, Ellen did not forget her children and kept in close touch with them by frequent letters. In 1859, to her five-year-old son, Willie, she described her activities and experiences in language he could understand. With one letter, she sent a small box of candy with the admonition, you must eat it only when Jenny thinks it is best. Eat a very little at a time. And to her 18-year-old son Edson, she wrote in 1868, I was disheartened and so was your father to see you so ready to put on a coat which cost $26, merely to walk down to the office. Edson, I am sorry that you do not manifest more care in regard to your clothing. When she was not traveling, some hours each morning were usually devoted to her writing. In the afternoons, sewing, mending, knitting, or occasional shopping trips to town, or visits with sick neighbors occupied her time. After receiving the vision concerning health in 1863, the Whites returned to their home, determined to put into practice what she had been shown. Little did she realize how hard the battle with appetite would be. Up to this time, meat had been the principal article in her diet. She relished eating it and did not enjoy simple, unrefined food. What is more, she believed that she needed meat for strength because her health was poor and she often fainted several times a week. In the vision, however, she was shown the advantages of a simple diet free from such stimulating food. She instructed her cook not to serve meat anymore. simple food or I will not eat at all. Stomach, you may wait until you eat bread. Her success in this battle brought immediate benefits. It was not long before she was able to enjoy simple and wholesome food. Six months later she wrote that her health had never been better and that the faint and dizzy spells had left her. In 1867, the Whites moved to Greenville in northern Michigan. For two years, James had been very ill from stress, overwork, and the effects of a stroke. 
his sickness persuaded his wife to take some unusual measures in an attempt to help him regain his health. Although the physicians at the Water Cure Institution in Dansville had warned James that physical activity could lead to another stroke, his wife had been shown in vision that without physical and mental activity, he could not hope to recover. In the midsummer of 1867, she saw an opportunity to involve her husband in some physical exercise. While the hay was drying in the fields, she visited their neighbours and persuaded them to say that they were too busy with their own harvesting to help her husband when he asked for their assistance. Reluctantly, they agreed to cooperate. According to plan, when the request was made, James White was very disappointed at the response. His wife, however, spoke up. Let us show our neighbours we can work ourselves. As they passed by, the locals were surprised to see the lady who had been recently conducting public meetings, pitching hay on the wagon, treading it down and building the stack as she worked with her husband and son, Willie. But more importantly, her innovative strategy helped restore her husband's health and strength. Due to the primitive state of photography at the time, no photograph exists of Ellen White smiling, although one artist has drawn this picture based on an early photo. In actual fact, Mrs. White was anything but morose. She was known to enjoy a hearty laugh at an amusing situation or a nice turn of words. Like many of us, she gained weight with age. When a friend in Japan sent her a knitted vest-like garment called a hug me tight, she found it much too small. She wrote expressing her great appreciation for the gift and added wryly, But there's a great deal more to Sister White than most people think. James and Ellen White lived in Battle Creek much of the time until 1881. Their marriage was a happy one and they shared a very tender relationship in spite of the strength of their personalities and some occasional differences of opinion. For like the biblical prophets, Ellen White was not without her faults. In 1876, she had occasion to write to her husband. I am not free from mistakes and errors in my life. Had I followed my savior more closely, I should not have to mourn so much my unlikeness to his dear image. Again, I say, forgive me every word or act that has grieved you. Like most marriages, Ellen's was not all sweetness and light. When James died prematurely in Battle Creek in 1881 at the age of 60, Ellen White felt the loss deeply. Yet at the funeral, she spoke of her resignation to God's will, of the Christian's hope, and of Jesus, who, she said, was more precious to her than he ever had been in any previous hour in her life. James White was buried in Oak Hill Cemetery, Battle Creek, near his two sons. Ten years later, in 1891, Ellen White sailed for Australia. Unfortunately, she soon fell ill with malarial fever and inflammatory rheumatism. For the next 11 months, she experienced the most terrible suffering of her whole life and became an almost helpless invalid. Yet in the following year, she was able to write, These months of suffering have been the happiest years of my life because of the companionship of my Savior. I am so thankful I have had this experience because I am better acquainted with my precious Lord. All through my sickness, his love, his tender compassion was my comfort, my continual consolation. One reason why she had come to Australia was to help in the setting up of a school. 
In 1894, she inspected a property of 1,450 acres in Kurrenbong, New South Wales, and was impressed that this site should be the school location. The land was subsequently purchased and a portion cleared of its huge eucalypt trees. In vision, an angel told Ellen White that though the soil appeared to be poor, rightly worked, it would produce abundant crops. As an expression of her faith, she purchased 40 acres from the estate and began to plan for her own home and the laying out of an orchard. On just two acres, over 500 fruit trees of a dozen different varieties were planted using the method the angel had explained to her. It was said that if Ellen White heard of any fruit tree, vegetable or flower that would not grow in the area, she would plant it because she believed false witness had been given about the land. Despite the adverse agricultural reports, within 18 months of planting, she was able to describe the fruit from her peach trees in a letter to a friend in South Africa. These are the most beautiful in appearance. I have never seen them larger. Two of them weighed one pound. We are seeing the exact fulfillment of the light the Lord has given me, that if the land is worked thoroughly, it will yield its treasures. In December 1895, Ellen White and her helpers moved into this 11-room cottage, which she later named Sunnyside. It was situated in Avondale Road, Kurrenbong, not far from the school, and was to be her home until her return to the United States in 1900. It was here that she received many prophetic dreams that helped guide the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not only in Australia, but also in America and in other countries. The Avondale School was to be a pattern school for the educational work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here she met with the school principal and teachers who were anxious that its operations should be in harmony with the instruction God had given to her. Here at Sunnyside in 1898, she completed her book on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages. She also cared for her grandchildren here, as well as for other children needing a home. Her kind and happy disposition meant that children never felt tense, nervous, or ill at ease in her company. And one for me, too. Good morning, brother. It was here, too, that she cared for the needs of the sick in the surrounding district. She often gave food from her own garden and orchard, along with clothing and money, to those in need. On one occasion, a group of local fishermen, grateful for her help, sent Avondale School a crate of fish. The cook accustomed to serving vegetarian meals, wondered whether she should throw them out. Ellen White responded, Of course not. Aren't there people in the community who would be thankful for them? Send them the fish with our compliments. She then wrote a letter of thanks to the fishermen for their kindness, expressing her appreciation of the thought behind the gift. Before she left Sunnyside in Australia in late August 1900, a beautiful velvet-bound autograph album was presented to her in the Kurrenbong Church. The handwritten messages came from churches and individuals expressing appreciation, friendship and love. It also included pictures of churches, portraits of friends and scenes from her Sunnyside home. 
One page was even reserved for shots of her watchdog, Tiglath Pileser. Ellen White was 72 years old when she left Australia. On the journey to America, she was concerned about where she would find a home. But two days before the ship docked in San Francisco, God assured her in vision that he had a refuge prepared for her, where she would have quiet and rest. Within a week of her arrival, she was directed to this furnished seven-room home. It was set at the foot of the hill below the St. Helena Sanitarium in California. To her delight, she found she could buy it for less than she had received for the sale of Sunnyside. The residence was given the name Elmshaven, and it was to be her home for the last 15 years of her life. Ellen White's granddaughter, Mrs. Grace Yarks, recalls those happy times with her grandmother at Elmshaven. Now we often had a hot drink for breakfast, post them, sometimes cocoa, which is really just chocolate flavored milk. We had a lot of milk. A hot cereal, well cooked, served with cream, fresh fruit, usually a dish of stewed fruit if it, was, if it wasn't summertime when we could have fresh fruit but usually if it was at all possible we had fresh fruit from the garden there was an orchard with peaches apples pears and even persimmons so that we had fruit through very much of the year fruit was a, one of the main dishes of breakfast now once in a while we would have an egg for breakfast so Ellen White herself never gave up the use of milk and eggs. She needed the eggs and, and milk for protein, cottage cheese we made. She could not use dried legumes. She was allergic to even lentils. And my mother made the most delicious lentil roast with olives in it. But grandmother couldn't eat it. She just had to watch us enjoy it. She herself could not eat the, the dried legumes of any type, it seems. So she would need, you could see, to use as long as possible eggs and milk, but she made sure to see that the milk was scalded so there was no danger from germs in the milk, and also to see that the eggs were from hens that were grain fed. And uh, everyone was happy, Never, nothing ever unpleasant at the table, and often some rather amusing things happened at the table. Some was amusing for some people and not for others. I remember one man and his wife was here, and she uh, was pregnant, and uh, she wanted some white bread, and her husband wouldn't let her touch white bread. It had to be this dark gray of bread, which is all right, but she wanted some white bread, and he said, no, you mustn't eat any white bread. So here they were at the table, and uh, sitting at the table, and, and Ellen White looked around after the blessing, and she said, um, to the lady, she was looking at the bread on the table, and it was dark bread. And she said, this is so-and-so, would you enjoy a little white bread? And that's what she'd just been wanting. But her husband said, no, you must, you must always have entire wheat bread for the nourishment. You must have the nourishment. But once in a while, it's nice to have something you just want. And Helen White seemed to know that and without asking anything. She said, may I get you some white bread? And she did. I imagine the husband felt rather embarrassed, I don't know. And she wasn't straight-laced, I mean, what should I say? She didn't want us to take her writings as a straight jacket. It was there for, they were, her writings were to assist in uh, different activities in life. She was well-liked. She used to stop at the carriage and they'd go by the vineyards and men were working there. She'd stop and talk to them about it, different things and, and about their work. And if she heard that there was a new baby someplace, whether they were Adventist or not, that didn't make any difference. Well, she'd in the carriage go in the afternoon 
take some present to them, to the new baby, you know, and recognize that something has happened that means something to them, the people, that she enjoyed it too. She was a very outgoing person. Many times the angels came to this room, and stood by her side, and instructed her. Wouldn't that be interesting to talk to the angels? Someday we'll be able to talk to our angels, and that'll be wonderful. But the most interesting time was when Jesus himself was here, and I can't forget that. How interested he was in the, in the little lady who was trying to carry out the instruction that was given her, and writing and writing. Elmshaven today is much the same as it was when Grace used to visit her grandmother here. This is the living room where visitors were greeted and the family met morning and evening for worship. Ellen especially loved this fireplace with its brown tiles depicting the legend of King Arthur and his knights. As she neared the end of her life, Ellen White enjoyed a triumphant experience of faith. She knew Jesus as her saviour and friend, and looked forward to the home in the new earth that she had seen many times in vision. Often as she moved around her home, she could be heard singing the words composed in 1845 by William Hyde. He had written them after hearing her account of her first vision of heaven given in December 1844 the last part of the song she especially loved. We'll be there, we'll be there in a little while. We'll join the pure and the blessed. We'll have the palm, the rope, the crown, and for us It was while entering her writing room on a Sabbath morning in February 1915 that she tripped and fell, her hip broken. Oh. Oh, the wind that came time, we could see that she was not going to live very long. We sent for my sister Mabel, who was dean of women at Loma Linda, to come and be here at the time. So they put the head of the bed by the fireplace, and we all gathered around. And she breathed less and less deeply, and just finally stopped breathing. There was no struggle. We wondered if she would say something. You always wonder, will people say something at last? But she didn't. She had already said what she wanted to say. She said, I know in whom I believe. There was no panic, so she just quietly stopped breathing in July at, what time is it, by that clock, quarter to four. On Sabbath, July 24, her funeral service was conducted in the Dime Tabernacle, Battle Creek. Some three and a half thousand people crowded into the church, and a thousand more stood on the lawns outside. Ellen White lies buried in the family plot in the Oak Hill Cemetery, Battle Creek, beside her husband and other members of her family. Together, they wait for the resurrection morning.
As with all God's messengers through the ages, Ellen White experienced the joys and sorrows of life. Like them, she did not lose the uniqueness of her personality, nor was she suddenly endowed with abilities that she did not previously possess. She was no plaster saint, but was one who always acknowledged that she was a sinner saved by God's grace. Like the prophets before her, she struggled with temptation, mourned her unchristlike character, possessed at times a faulty memory, had her likes, dislikes, and her own tastes of dressing and homemaking. She recognized her limitations of knowledge and understanding, apart from the revelations received from the Lord, and she lamented her inadequate writing ability. But she was also a warm, caring, and generous-hearted wife, mother, and friend, who was greatly devoted to her God and to those about her. Chosen by God as his messenger to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God used her through the prophetic gift to bring unity of faith, to guide and strengthen the church, to magnify the principles of his word, and to bring to men and women a clearer view of Jesus. Of her writings, she declared, They will constantly speak, and their work will go forward so long as time shall last. great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant, and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child who was to rule all nations with an iron scepter and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought back. But he was not strong enough, and he lost his place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. These dramatic words of Revelation chapter 12 describe the most momentous war this universe has ever witnessed, the conflict between Christ and the forces of good and Satan and his cohorts of evil. The origin, progress, and glorious climax of this great controversy story were also revealed to Ellen White in a two-hour vision given her on Sunday, March 14, 1858, in Lovett's Grove, now known as Bowling Green, Ohio. She was told to write out what she had seen, but she was also warned of the consequences, for Satan would make strong efforts to prevent her. The assurance was given her, however, that God's angels would not leave her in the conflict. She soon discovered what this meant. The next day, James and Ellen White left Bowling Green and took the train for Battle Creek, Michigan. On the way, they made plans to write out and publish what she had seen.
Arriving at Jackson in Michigan, they left the train to stay with their friends, Daniel Palmer and his wife. The whites had not been there long when Ellen experienced a strange cold sensation over her heart. It passed up over her head and down her right side. Her tongue refused to utter what she wanted to say and seemed large and numb. As she lost consciousness, her husband and friends dropped to their knees and began to pray. That night she suffered considerable pain, but was sufficiently revived the next morning to continue the journey to their home in Battle Creek. Ellen White was carried up these stairs to her bedroom, where for several weeks she could not feel the touch of the hand or the coldest water poured on her head. She tried to struggle to her feet in an attempt to walk, but at times fell helpless to the floor. In this condition, she started to write on the great controversy. She wrote one page and then lay back exhausted for three days. Picking up her pen, she wrote another page only to be forced to rest again. This went on for weeks, but gradually the writing became easier and faster. In September 1858, this small volume came from the press. It carries the title, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1 the great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. It contains 41 chapters, beginning with the fall of Satan and concluding with the second death. During the remaining 57 years of her life, Ellen White received other visions concerning the great controversy story. She also studied the writings of historians that provided her with dates and details of minor importance not presented in the visions. These, together with her knowledge of the Bible, enabled her to greatly enlarge her initial account and write out a connected history of what she had seen. Finally, these five volumes in the Conflict of the Ages series, containing 3,600 pages, set forth most completely the origin, progress, and final acts in the great drama of the ages. In the introduction to her book, The Great Controversy, Ellen White explains why the scenes of the long-continued conflict between good and evil were revealed to her and why she was instructed to make it known to others. In the great final conflict, Satan will employ the same policy, manifest the same spirit, and work for the same end as in all preceding ages. That which has been will be except that the coming struggle will be marked with a terrible intensity such as the world has never witnessed. The issues in that struggle and the final acts in the great controversy of the ages are portrayed in Revelation chapters 13 and 14. Revelation 13 predicts that all the Earth's inhabitants will finally be brought to a decision of submission and allegiance to either Christ or Satan. To prepare for this last great crisis, God sends a threefold message of warning described in Revelation 14. It is to be preached to every nation, tribe, language and people, for every human being must be given the opportunity to make the ultimate choice. Worship the Creator, or worship the power identified as the beast, the ultimate counterfeit of truth, and the dragon, Satan, who gives to him his power his throne and his great authority. According to Revelation 14, this message is not sent, however, until God's great final judgment commences in heaven. Right on time, a people arose to proclaim that that judgment hour had come. William Miller heralded the soon return of Christ. Hiram Edson pointed to the beginning of Christ's final work of judgment in the heavenly sanctuary in 1844. Rachel Oakes shared the knowledge of the Seventh-day Sabbath that had been preserved down through time. And Joseph Bates saw its prophetic significance in preparing a people for the coming of the Lord. To Ellen White was given the testimony of Jesus, the prophetic gift, 
to provide guidance and direction in the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Through her visions, God directed in the founding of a worldwide program of schools, colleges, hospitals, health food factories, publishing houses and churches. All these are dedicated to the sharing of the good news of God's great love and of Christ's soon return. From every nation under heaven, people are responding to God's call to worship him as the creator and redeemer. The Bible identifies them by their faithfulness to Jesus and their keeping God's commandments expressed in their love to God and their fellow man. To a world desperate for a ray of hope in the darkness of increasing disease and despair, violence and fear, they have a message bringing healing, reconciliation and liberation. Jesus died for the sins of all. He lives to grant forgiveness to those who ask him for it. And he is soon to return to establish a new world where pain and tears and death will be no more. Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud. It is the cloud which surrounds the Savior. In solemn silence, the people of God gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth, becoming lighter and more glorious until it is a great white cloud. Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flash of lightning, the roar of thunder, the voice of the Son of God calls forth his sleeping saints. The living righteous are changed. Now they are made immortal, and with the risen saints are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and with songs of gladness ascend together to the city of God. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Amen.